For Hunt said, I can trademark it for $275. I said, okay, we'll do it. Then we'll send him a letter and tell him to quit using it. And then if he wants to sue us, he can sue us. <laughs> Where is everybody? Well, I, you know, two of them ain't going to get here for four nine o'clock. Oh, well, that's true. So, <laughs> I figure that ten minutes out. Yeah. And I'm surprised. I don't know where Doug is. He's usually here early. Yeah, I don't know he where he is. is. Door, first one. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Week. Yeah, that's what Jessica said. That ought to be fun. I'll go with it. I would love to. I love DC. I wish I could. It's a busy week for me, though. Be there and meet me all the time. I bet. I bet. Therese, call me. I can do it. I'll call myself. I bet I got a stack of envelopes about that high sitting in the desk for you to bring back to you. Yeah, because yeah, there ain't no sense in them sitting down. We got a time here. Well, still wasteful to see one name on there, two names. Because we can transform. I believe that. Anyway, I, I'll, I'm going to keep it. Hardly ever. They got to really be happy for me to throw Sorry, some dirty words on here. I don't see you on any on this one. <laughs> okay. Who stole the little table back here? And the media name plate. I couldn't find the media name plate. I couldn't find it either. I don't know where it went. I don't know. And the little table. Unless it's in one of the offices over there. <coughs> hey, good morning. <coughs> hey, what's going on, Cynthia? The Cynthia has something to sign. Okay. Okay. I'll be here. You want to see how this stuff works? Yeah. My iPad. Truman's usually here. Somebody said Holly was in Washington with her. Oh, that's where it's coming from. I should have come to Bill Langrum's birthday party. I hated to miss it. We had RSVP'd to come and plan to, and then my son's birthday was this weekend, and they planned to we'll get together too, so family took precedent. Well, they had a real nice party. I understood that. Thank you. 
I don't think this would survive on tap. I think tap would just eat it. Throw it out like a snack. Fuck her. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's 9 a.m., and we're going to go ahead and get started with our uh, not, uh, March 26th workshop. Okay, first on the agenda, on the agenda, uh, we have uh, Brett Bell and Bob Stapleton of the uh, Griffiths Fallen Chamber of Commerce Military Affairs Committee, who desire to address the board regarding the Fourth of July parade and celebration. Good morning. Madam Mayor, good morning. Good morning to you, and thank you so much for allowing us to come and speak this morning. Uh, I think everybody knows me, but just in case you don't, my name's Bob Stapleton. I am the president of the <coughs> Griffin Spalding Military Affairs Committee. Uh, several processes that the, co the committee goes through each year. We, we coordinate the Veterans Day program and the Memorial Day program, and the, we always have a parade on Independence Day, and quite frankly, the parade is awful. So we decided that our community deserved a better event than that. So we we're trying to put together a parade and a celebration of this country's independence. Uh, we've talked to the county about the use of Volunteer Park. Uh, we've talked to Southern Crescent about the use of some of their property and also with the school system. We'd like very much to see the fireworks display moved from the airport, which we know is up for sale and going to be sold in the future, so the fireworks have to be moved anyway. We'd like very much to see the fireworks move to the, the, the ball field behind Southern Crescent. We have spoke to them about that. Uh, we realize that that's way out of our scope of work, and we know that the city and the county are in charge of all that, so we'd ask your support, and we visited with the chief and his officers, and they're pretty much on board with it. We'd like very much to have for your support to continue that effort to move the fireworks to that location. I believe that if the fireworks were moved to there, you would be able to see the fireworks from the Lowe's parking lot, the Kroger parking lot, the parking lot there uh, at the, of course, there at Southern Crescent and the parking lot where we will assemble for the parade. So, uh, the, it would... Excuse me for a second. The fireworks, you said, behind Southern Crescent, you're talking about between um, the uh, Career Academy and Southern Crescent building? Mm -hmm. Behind, yes ma'am, there's, there's a ball field back there. Uh, it's, it's back up against the road, and that field is what we talked about, that location. Anyway, they, all of the, the chief and his folks at the fire department had that information, and they're working to see about uh, making that happen for us. So we think that would be great. The concept, is, again, is to support veterans. That's what Military Affairs Committee does. Uh, this year, we, we have a lot of soldiers from our community who are deployed to Afghanistan. And so we've decided to use On Guard for Our Guard as a theme for the parade. Uh, and Brett will tell you more about that in just a moment. Brett is the project officer for this, and we, we really want to have a community-type event that used to take place in Griffin over at the park and see what we can do about bringing things together for young families to come to and, and be a part of and talk about the importance of independence and try to generate a community feeling and support for our veterans and support for independence. Day. So I know I'm Kenny sitting over looking at his watch said, how long is this guy going to talk today? Uh, so I'm going to let Brett talk. Mr. Brett Bell, this guy is like the jack in the box. You crank him up and he pops out. He's good to go. It's just amazing to me all the stuff he does. Thank you, Bob. Hey, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, first off, thank you so much for allowing me to come and share about our vision around the Independence Day celebration. Like Bob was saying, um, they asked me to take charge of this to work alongside folks to hopefully make it better and make it more attended. So one of the things in reviewing that I 
try supporting changing is the parade will not be in the morning. Um, the parade actually will start at 1700, and excuse me, let me get, switch gears. Parade will start at 5 p.m. Folks will line up at 3.30. Most folks don't line the street early in the morning on their days off. That was one of the things we just realized. So that's the whole purpose of moving the parade. We also want to take the onus off the parade being the major draw, and that's where the Volunteer Park comes into play. The activities will start in Volunteer Park around 3 p.m. so as to get folks in the park and with the new parade route going around that park, i.e. we've already got more folks attending the parade than we've had in the past three years. I think there may have been about 20 folks lying in the street last year along that parade route. Um, <clears throat> The other focus that I identified is that the parades have never had any type of theme. So like Bob said, we focused on the fact that we just had military personnel deployed from our community. Um, that was a big draw, big turnout at the Kiwanis Club to see them off. So we came up with the theme on guard for our guard. We've already created a symbol for it. We also have parade guidelines. We've got a parade registration form. We're going to have a vendor registration form. Once we get your final support after today in, in seeking the activities that will be in the park. Mike Bob is, was saying <clears throat> our goal is to bring make it more of a family oriented event. So in the park we've already talked with the Griffin Exchange Club to have kind of a mini cornhole tournament in one of the six fields. We've also gotten support from the county to build out us two bandstands because we want to have local musicians come and play throughout the day. Comedians come and um, do spoken word throughout the day. We also want to have bouncies, face painting. We want the Boy Scouts to um, sell hot dogs, etc. We want food trucks. We've got loft division and I, I'm confident that it's going to gain traction and all come to fruition. We're working on getting a Black Hawk helicopter to come land in one of the fields. In order to get folks out, there's got to be a wide net cast because what I like Rodney may not like, what I like, Cynthia may not like. So again, the goal is to get a wide array of folks. Like Bob was saying, again, when you guys used to have it in City Park, I've been told that it's so crowded, it was so crowded over there, you could barely park, you could barely walk through to get to the activities. So as to not <clears throat> take your time up too long, that's pretty much the gist, and you'll hear more about it as we really start marketing this, um, starting this weekend. Um, you'll see it on Facebook, you'll start seeing it everywhere, but the gist of the reason we're here is to gain your support in the following capacity. For the bandstands, we'll need temporary power, ran somehow to these bandstands. We'll need security. That means police officer presence. We'll need extra dumpsters in hopes that folks will utilize those. Uh, we'll obviously need fire protection, firemen. We'll need traffic control, more police. And we'll need a street, street sweeper after the cleanup. Our goal is to, to to come into Volunteer Park, and, and for you all that have gone to the fireworks over at the airport, Rose's parking lot, you know that when that thing is all over, that whole parking lot is just scattered with trash and everything. Our goal is not to come into this park and leave it unkempt, but to utilize the Spalding County inmate population to assist with our cleaning it up, not that night, but the very next day. Um, the last thing that I just want to reiterate in regards to where we need your support is our vision initially when we started this back in November was to have the volunteer park activity start at 3, have the parade start about two hours later, and then after the parade ends about 6, 6.30, depending on the number of entries we have, an hour or two later, have the fireworks show go off right there in that same vicinity. Well, like he was saying, we've met with Jim Smith over at Griffin, we've met with Alveda Thomas over at Southern Crescent, <laughs> and 
the field that we want to use is in Southern Crescent, it's the foundation, and you, you got to talk to businesses, and it's just too large of a negotiation when what we're really here for is to have a celebration. So the other piece that we would like your support is, is taking the reins, working with the county and working with the fire department and moving our fireworks over to the um, field that we've identified. And I think that field was called Flint High School Field or something like that. But that's pretty much the gist of it. I can answer any questions you may have um, if I haven't covered anything. I mean, the issue comes down as far as we're concerned is with the fire department. If the fire department's okay with the location from a safety standpoint of the fireworks, I, I didn't feel comfortable making that change because I know how sometimes people in Griffin don't like change. So I didn't want to make the call to move the fireworks from the airport location because that's the location that over the years the people have become have become accustomed to. But I guess the, it comes down to Chief Jones and his folks as to whether it's feasible to have them at the location that they want, everything else. From our standpoint, it's just moving people's security dumpsters from one location to another, so it really doesn't matter to us. And you have significant parking lots around the area with shopping centers that would enable folks, whether they're at Walmart, at Lowe's, wherever. It's, it's on a ridge there that... That is true. There's, there's, there's ample um, parking lot. One of the activities we're also going to have is several different types of cars being shown in the parking lots more acutely near Southern Crescent. But there's Lowe's, there's Home Depot, there's Kroger. And one thing is with the gauge or, or the size of the firework that won't be um, pro, won't bother the buildings in fallout, you'll still be able to see those fireworks go up from those parking lots. Meaning if you come and you're not part of the volunteer activities, you're not part of the parade, you can still come after your day of barbecue and at home, pull in the Home Depot and tailgate and you can see the fireworks from that location. The other good thing about that is you're not on a two-lane road, so you don't have all of this bogged down traffic when folks are coming in and when folks are getting out. You've got um, 1941 there, you've got Taylor Street 16 there, so folks will be able to get out a lot quicker. Plus, the, plus again, the, the airport is going to be sold here sooner um, than later. Yeah. Well, I think it's a great idea. I think it's long. We should have done it, maybe. Chief Jones, y'all, y'all are good with it. Y'all have talked to these people. You know the location. The fireworks company, I think, has been contacted as well, and they're okay with moving. So. Kenny, you can blame me, okay? You got people calling you fussing about the case. <laughs> oh, I will. Blame it on me. I will. You're going to anyway. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the blame. I really will. Okay. Give so me your Facebook page. All right. Whatever, whatever. Okay. So we're good? Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Right. Thank you guys so much. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was informed that there was a misread here that needed to address the board. Uh, and it's not on the agenda, um, but since she came, um, what my suggestion is that we uh, um, would do you the same way we would do in the afternoons. We give you three minutes to kind of to tell us or discuss what it is you need to talk to us about. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Deanie Collier Reed. I'm a citizen here in the city of Griffin, and um, I'm also a contractor. Um, I had some concerns um, about some things in the city of Griffin. First of all, I want to say that, like I said, I am a citizen. I am a taxpayer. Um, I'm a person that wants to see the growth of the city. I'm interested in the growth of the city. Actually, the growth of the city have been some of my prayers. I wanted to see the housing change. I wanted to see the conditions of the housing change. I want to see people live better. And um, I want to be a part of that. 
But my concern this morning was that in um, working with the city of Griffin, which I feel like since I'm a taxpayer, I am the city of Griffin. The city of Griffin are the people of Griffin. And the people that serve in the city of Griffin, of course, are public servants. And as a taxpayer, um, I have a concern that I don't feel like the city of Griffin have been quite fair in working with me on doing um, certain things. And uh, there's this, um, I want to say this, the codes that are written in the code book. They're written for the health, safety, and welfare of the individuals in the community. And I'm very much for the health, safety, and welfare of everybody in the community. But uh, we have a population and a community that I'm concerned about that maybe don't have a voice. And so I'm here today, like I said, I'm working out on a project uh, on uh, North 6th Street. And on that project, those uh, apartments were condemned. And there was a former owner out of that, those apartments that did a lot of crazy stuff out there. And uh, it wasn't permitted. There was a lot of changes made. Uh, no fines that I know of was issued to him. I, I'm not sure. But he did a lot of crazy things out there. And the apartments have kind of set, you know, in a bad condition. But an owner come to town and bought the apartments and was trying to fix the apartments up. So what I feel like is unfair in the fixing up of the apartments, renovation construction is totally different from new construction. When you have new construction, you're starting out from the ground. You're building up. So it's a much easier process. But when you have renovations, it's a much more difficult process because you have to tear things out rebuild things, refix things. You have so many unexpected things that happen that you have to work on. And so in this process, I feel like it's not quite understood, but the city of Griffin um, has made it to where when a property is condemned, they give you 45 days to fix it up. That's virtually impossible. It's setting the owner, it's setting the contract, it's setting everybody up for failure. So I feel like in the city, I think we should be comparable with the other municipalities. Decatur, Marietta, Cobb County, East Point, all those municipalities. If someone come in and they purchase a property and they work on trying to fix that property up, as long as consistent progress is being made on the property, then they let uh, the owner, the contractor, continue to do the work. Like I said, because I think this is something that we should be working on together. I know I'm not against the city since I live here. I'm for the city. Like I said, I, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, basically, the three minutes are up. But what, what we have to say to you is, I don't, this is not really the venue to discuss whatever it is your issue is, and I know that this, whatever this project you're talking about is in court, so whatever is going on with it, it's been enough time that it's completely out of our hands. You know, there's nothing that the Board of Commissioners can do about whatever the issue is. Well, I want to say this in closing. I, I would just like to see the city of Griffin, like I said, as all the other communities that are willing to work uh, with, you know, the contractors, like I said, and fixing up properties, then let it be the proper time. Work, like I said, all the other... Okay. I, I feel like it has been the proper time. Anytime something, an issue has gotten to the court where the judge is making a decision, the, the time has, as far as I'm concerned, has passed. Uh, there's been ample opportunity, years and years. I've been on this board for 18 years. And the development you're talking about, we've been dealing with this development ever since I've been here. I don't know how much longer than that we've dealt with it. But after 18 years, I don't care who, the, uh, who owned it or who, whatever the issue was, they, they applied for permits a couple of years ago. I, we have, there are guidelines that we have to follow. There was a previous owner. We have to follow. We have to follow. So if it's gotten to a point where it was condemned and, um, and we don't condemn, the city don't condemn, Understand. that comes from a, a, another housing uh, uh, authority. I understand that. But 
like I said, it's a legal issue and it's out of our hands. There's nothing we can do about it at this point. But I feel like our, our, our codes and our ordinances are, are, are fair and they might not exactly line up with whatever DeKalb or other counties are, but they're the ones that we have on our books and they're the ones that we have to go by. I feel like they're fair as far as the codes, but I'm saying two years ago, this, this, this person, I'm just saying if a new owner, a new person get a property and they're trying to fix it up and consistently work on it, then I think the city should work with them on, because like I said, we're working toward the same goal. That is to live, work, and play in the city of Griffin. And that's, uh, uh, an Arab Indian guy owned it. And like I said, that was the person that made the mess out there and no, it wasn't fixed up, it wasn't cleaned up, it wasn't permitted. But there's a new owner, like I said, that's trying to fix it up and make it for senior citizens, make affordable housing for senior citizens. That's what's trying to be done with the property now. <clears throat> okay, um, the next uh, item on the agenda is to discuss, discuss elected officials' travel and training expense policy. Do you have something to do? Did you put I, I think it was something that you guys wanted uh -huh. to bring up. Commissioner Tinsley in particular asked that we put this on the agenda. So the, the current travel and training expense policy for the elected officials was last amended in April of 2003. Uh, so it is kind of dated. Uh, it's open for discussion. Well, my discussion, I found out yesterday that our budget for training, travel, per diem, if you will, we're basically out of money. Yes, yeah, so uh, there's been a little more uh, travel this past fiscal year than in the past, and we weren't necessarily prepared for it, so we, we do have funds for the GMA conference in June, but other than that, y'all's travel and training budget is uh, about expended at this point. I think that, uh, I don't know what the rest of the commissioners feel like, but I've been done for 44 years, and in that time period, any time we traveled, and of course, as court knows, our travel flying was free, but we had to turn an expense statement. I don't know what you guys feel about that. Um, we turn in our expense statements. Well, I just turn in, you know, my receipts or whatever. There's a, you have a policy, there's a, there's a limitation, uh, a guideline as to what it is that, uh, like as, as far as uh, food or... Yeah, that's what's covered in the 2003 uh, policy is, is what all what do you mean when you say expenses? the amounts that are covered. Well, like, that you know, your, your, your training classes, what classes you went to, uh, your keep up your mileage, your, your meals. Well, we do all uh, that. Yeah. that that's, what, that's why we that's turn that in our receipts to the reason you sign it. Okay. But, <laughs> maybe, yeah, but maybe I'm the big and, 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 Maybe, know, maybe, I've maybe Ken will just explain to you. Um, well, what may happen sometime is Ms. Watson may fill out that form for you based on Probably what, so. what yeah. receipts she no, brings back. <laughs> or at least she assists with filling out your form. So. It, it's, it's kind of my understanding that when, when we set the budget, there's a certain amount designated for travel and expenses. And um, I got somewhere in our charter, uh, there's uh, the two... Um, conferences that the city actually budget for are the GMA, um, Mayor's Day, and the Summer Conference. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe it might be a little bit play in there somewhere, but we're not set up so that anytime we want to just go to a training because the, um, the employees are not set up that way. So it's just like, you know, if you decide that you want to go to two or three uh, different trainings a year, then that pretty much depletes, you know, other than the ones that we've set aside, that pretty much depletes our budget for that. And it or, says that sufficient justification and training material must be presented to the board. 
outside of the primary training conferences. So outside of the two that you're talking about, it says that justification of training material must be presented. And that hasn't been happening. That's in the... So, and I, I guess what, what in the basically <clears throat> what, what's been happening is, because um, I haven't gone this year any other, anything other than the ones that's designated for us in the charter. But when somebody wants to go to training, we just bring it before us and kind of vote on it. But I guess we, basically now what we need to do is try to kind of govern ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, because, like I said, the ones that's in the charter that we are, the city does put in for us to go to, when we, we're doing so much extra stuff that we don't even have enough money in the budget to pay for that, then that's an issue. Well, again, if we will follow the policy, it says under economical use of funds, in order to control budgets and to promote the conservative use of funds, the city commission, where possible, will limit the number of officials who travel to the same conference and will utilize a rotating assignment basis for conference attendance. So that would mean that we would have to be a lot more selective in what outside conferences we attended if it's on a rotating basis. That means everybody didn't get to go to what they want to go to. Well, every year we budget for everybody to attend the GMA Summer Conference, Mayor's Day Conference in January, the MEAG Conference, uh, uh, MEAG Mayor's Day, uh, there's a couple more district meetings. district meetings, and then especially if we have new commissioners, we budget for new commissioner training, the mandated new commissioners training, uh, and then we put in a little extra because things come up from time to time that uh, commissioners want to go to. We bring those to y'all in advance for y'all to approve them unless it's unless it's GMA or me or the MEAG meeting. We bring all of the individual meetings to you in advance. All those have copies of the itineraries and what the training is about, so you have all that information. So we have a pretty liberal travel and training policy. And uh, this year, I just think there were a couple of extra things thrown in there that depleted the budget. So I, I just wanted you to know that <clears throat> GMA summer conference is covered, but anything between now and then will put us uh, fairly significantly over budget. I hate to be this guy, but well, I, I can only speak for myself. I haven't taken any extra travel other than the GMA, <clears throat> the MEAG, and I think I was scheduled for Callaway Gardens, but we had an, um, somewhat of an event. Uh, approximately a year ago. Let me ask you a question before I forget. So like the when we did the Callaway Gardens, was that in the budget or was that one of the additional? Archway is also in the budget, okay. yes ma'am. We budget for the Archway Retreat every okay, year. Okay, I'm going to still get No, 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 you, no, 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 I, you're still an anything. I'm just making for the record. I mean, I don't know if they're, <laughs> and maybe they will speak or forever hold their peace who, whomever is doing the extra travel. The only other travel I had was the GMA board meeting in Athens, This, but I don't take any training classes at GMA or at, at um, Mayor's Day, so I don't have that. But, and then this time going to Auburn, I'm not spending the night, I'm driving in the morning for the 7 o'clock 30 meeting and then coming back that day, next month, so there won't be any expense. So perhaps we just need to be, I don't know, more mindful because everybody's got a, a little bit where you're not taking the training classes, but you're doing some other, so yeah. And you didn't take any extra classes. Well, you haven't taken, yeah. Okay, we're, so we're, everybody's doing something a little different, but we have to figure out how to reserve our budget. Because then if anybody wanted to do anything, now we can. Yeah, what, I think what I was saying was, I, I haven't taken a travel that was not in the budget. Yes. That's, that's what I mean. Yes. And the classes now are, are fairly expensive. They tend to increase a little bit every year. And uh, if you do your conference registration and then take a couple of classes or as many classes as you can take, 
Um, it drives the cost up pretty significantly. I mean, it used to just be one class was yep, offered. Six hours, but now it's two, now so that they charge double for the classes. Right. Mm -hmm. And e even at the um, like Mayor's Day and at uh, well, uh, in, in Savannah, other than the classes that they give, there's always different meetings and um, um, things that you can go to that you won't receive credit for, but they're paid uh, as paid educational things that you can go to rather than to pay for. Double, like I said, double for the classes that we're that we're taking now. Well, then maybe we need to relook at it because, like you said, the GMA format is different because they've got the. We were just being able to take the six-hour class, and now you can take two or three different three-hour classes, and then a six. So maybe we look at that part of how is that getting dispersed evenly? Because I'm still just signing up for one class because that's what we've been doing. But you can sign up for more. I mean. And that we had well, like I said, there are classes and like I said, there are district meet, uh, meetings and different uh, other events that are educational that you know we can attend. Um, I just like I said, but when you know you're taking a class, a class every day um, that we're having to pay for, then that I can easily see where that will run up. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there there are a lot of uh, a lot of other meetings involved that are part of your registration that are not paid uh, classes. Uh, there's policy committees and there's uh, presentations by other municipalities and there's just a lot of other things that we could partake of that doesn't cost anything because it's included in your registration. So I would urge you if you don't take advantage of those, I get more out of those than I do sitting in a training class all day. So I, I spend most of my time in the policy committees and those kind of things. But we have had a couple of new commissioners who have, have gone and got some good training over the last couple of years in an effort to get up to speed on things. So that's... Uh, that's pretty much taken our budget, but, but we should be okay between now and the end of the year if we don't have any additional expenses. Well, I know I can offer that my classes I've taken are all required classes for new commissioners. I've got, I think, one elected out of all the classes. I'm going to Athens in the spring, I think it's what, next month. <coughs> i got one elected there because I'm already going to be there, and then I've got one of the classes required. But, just because I can't remember, in January when, when we go to GMA, is it still just a Saturday class or do they have those half day classes on other days? They have one half day on Friday. They have a uh, Monday. It was a little bit compressed this year because of the Super Bowl activities. So I think, but in the past they've had half day and full day. Okay, because I mean, I, I guess for me as I'm looking at this policy, I'm thinking maybe it is something that we can look at how we incorporate that because it, it just hadn't even occurred to me that, that that format is so different than how it had been for so long. I was just under the assumption that when we were going to training, we were basically all spending the same thing because for so long we all signed up for one class. But, but now if it's... I can see where there's a lot of variation but. in in what each commissioner is spending. So I don't even know how we can budget based on what the typical expenditure is at GMA if we haven't considered the variation in the format. I've never taken a three-hour class. I just always sign up for the six. I don't even know what the price difference is between the three and the six-hour class. Yeah, there's there's a, a little bit of difference, but two sixty-five to one fifty. Okay. But I, I think if you guys just be mindful of, of you know, what what we budgeted and what you're spending, I mean, we, we budget a fairly significant amount because we want you to be involved and want you to get all the training. I think if you just be mindful, I don't know that there's any need to change anything in the policy. It's just be mindful when you sign up for something. Do we, do we keep a, a list of everyone that goes to the training that they completed the training that we paid for? Uh, yes. You have a uh, GMA actually keeps a transcript of the classes, and I believe that they monitor those pretty closely to make sure that. Does the city keep one? We get your transcript from GMA. Oh, okay. Okay. But you got to be mindful to police that as well because in mine, is, I went through with Teresa, there's mistakes in there that I went to classes, paid for the classes. 
got the little yellow receipt that showed off I completed the class. He yeah, looked at my transcripts. Well, where is it? It's not on my transcripts. Did, did they state did they sign it? Yeah, they signed it. They signed it. <laughs> I, had, I had the yellow slip, but then I went to three. Take a picture with the They checked it. <laughs> And actually, it was a six-hour class. I'm like, oh, yeah, he did attend this one. Yeah, I mean, I would urge you to, to keep an eye on it because yeah. they make mistakes. So. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, next, we're going to discuss negotiation and latest developments as far as how the warden's authority contract set to expire December 2020. Okay, I want to, uh, if you'll bear with me a minute, I want to give you a little uh, history about where we are and, and what's going on with the Spalding County water contract. As you know, the, the uh, wholesale agreement with Spalding County um, comes to an end December 31st of 2020. I want to take you back to February the 12th of 2018, which was a little more than a year ago. We received a letter from the Spalding County Water Sewer Facilities Authority Chairman, Mr. Lamb, which was our official notification that we were starting negotiations at that point. Uh, in March, we had some further discussion with uh, Mr. Lamb and representatives from that group, including the county manager and the county attorneys, and what they wanted at that time was a contract very similar to the Coweta County contract, if you recall. So we gave them basically a replica of the Coweta County contract. Uh, over some months, uh, Mr. Wilson and I were working on budget, and they reviewed the contract, sent it to their attorneys, uh, came back around September and discussed that proposed contract. The County Water and Sewer Authority through September, October had further discussions regarding that contract and how to move forward. Then in January of this year, uh, Mr. Wilson and I met, uh, just us two, to see if we could come up with some staff recommendation on where to go with this contract. That was January the 15th, just prior to the January 16th meeting of the Water Authority. At the January 16th, 2019 meeting of the Water Authority, uh, their audit was presented to them by their auditors. Uh, that audit revealed to them that they had revenue over expenses of $754,000, that their FY18 net income was $997,000, and that they had unrestricted cash in the bank of $14 million. Uh, during that meeting, the authority set the dates of February 20th and March the 19th to further discuss the, the water contract with the city of Griffin. On January the 23rd of 2019, Mr. Wilson, uh, County Chairperson Johnson, uh, County Commissioner Flowers Taylor, myself, uh, Chairman Ward, and that large Commissioner Holberg met because during mine and Mr. Wilson's conversation earlier in that month, the issue came up of considering a joint city-county water authority. Uh, that conversation had never come up before. It was an idea that Mr. Wilson and I batted around, and we decided that it would be best before we put a whole lot of investigation into such a possibility that we at least include our at-large commissioner and our chairperson into those discussions. So we had those discussions on, on January 23rd. On February the 20th, well, let me go back. At that meeting, there were a lot of questions, obviously a lot more questions than there were answers at that point about legal ramifications of the possibility of doing that. Was it even a possibility? Were there legal impediments that would keep us from continuing to discuss that? Uh, 
So we kind of left it at that point that we would contact the county attorney and the city attorney and get back together to have further discussions over whether or not that was even a possibility. So then on February the 20th of this year, uh, which was one of the dates set for the Water Authority to continue those discussions, uh, they had a meeting, uh, their consultant, Paragon Consulting Group was there, and they had uh, had Paragon look at the possibility of separating the two systems, cutting off the county system from the city system. Paragon reported at that meeting that to do so would take 59 meters to separately meter the county system from the city system, that it would be a cost of $6,244,725.36 approximately to do that, and that it would take about 12 months of construction time to install those meters and separate the system. So they have been contemplating the separation of the two systems. Don't know that they were prepared for a $6 million price tag just for the meter separation. Now that obviously did not include other construction items, did not include uh, things like how they would build that system if they became their own system, how they would maintain that system if they became their own system, where they would get their water from if they cut us off or whatever. So February the 25th, then the small group had another meeting. Uh, County Manager Wilson, Chairman Johnson, and Ms. Flowers Taylor, along with myself, Chairman Ward, and Mr. Holberg again, and this time we included City Attorney Whalen, County Attorney Fortune, and also uh, Stephanie Wyndham. And we looked at different legal avenues that would have to take place in order for us to separate the system, which was a very extensive discussion. And the only conclusion we drew at that point without further investigation was the possibility of looking at a short-term extension of the Spalding County contract, maybe one to two year extension and long term to look into the feasibility of a joint authority. Uh, then on March the 19th, the Spalding County Water and Sewer Facilities had another workshop uh, to discuss where we were and at this point County Manager Wilson uh, announced to the entire authority that we were considering options on combining uh, the Spalding County Water and Sewer Facilities Authority with a uh, city uh, combination to make a joint authority. So that discussion has now become public knowledge as of that meeting. So I wanted our entire board and the public here to be aware that those discussions had taken place. There are a lot of things to consider. Uh, I'll certainly let Dr. Keller and City Attorney weigh in on these, but there are a lot of things to consider if we are going to consider that possibility. Uh, probably one of the major things that we will have to consider is whether or not we're going to require payment uh, by this joint authority of our assets. And if we are, what are our assets worth? So if we're going to consider this further, the first thing is are we going to just give our assets to this new authority or are we going to expect payment for our assets from this authority? Uh, we also have debt, as you know. Uh, we have current uh, bonds on our facilities and now those are revenue bonds that are backed by our joint water and electric utilities enterprise. So separating those uh, starts a whole different discussion. Uh, if we're going to sell those our assets, then we would have to have those appraised and evaluated, and you're talking about probably several hundred thousand dollars to do that, just to determine what their value is, so you can make a determination on if you're going to sell them or not. Then it would have to go to the legislature. Any author new authority formed would be by legislative act, 
so we couldn't even consider that until next year uh, during the legislative session in 2020. Uh, of course, as a part of that legislation, you would have to determine what your uh, membership of that joint authority would be, who would appoint how many people from the county and the city. Uh, you've got uh, water withdrawal permits that are now in the city's name. Uh, so you would have to have consideration from EPD and EPA on your permits. And of course, right now, because we are the provider of water, we have all the employees. I think the county has like five or six employees. So we would have to determine if those our employees, their employees, or they're going to all work for this joint authority. How will that operate? Uh, of course, this joint authority would have to have facilities. Uh, we have easements on all of our water lines that are in our name, so there's a whole lot of information that would have to be put together, investigated, gleaned, and put in some kind of prospectus in order for us to consider such an authority. All that with the idea in mind that this contract expires in December of next year, so we have 19, 20 months, I guess. From the staff's perspective, there are a lot of questions. I, I don't want to say that it's not possible, and I don't want to say that from a staff perspective we would not entertain the idea. Uh, I think it needs a lot more investigation, and I think it will take a lot more time before I would feel comfortable giving you a yes or no recommendation. But it is open for discussion, and I'll let the city attorney chime in, I'll let Dr. Keller chime in, and we'll be glad to try to answer any questions that you might have in relation to that. Kenny, when they asked for a similar contract that we gave Calway to County, what was the backup on that? They, once they reviewed it, I mean, you would think they had already reviewed it. Well, there, was, there were a couple of things. One was Coweta has a take or pay contract. In other words, they have a set amount that they're going to pay for regardless of how much they take. Spalding County did not want to do that. Uh, Coweta has ramp up provisions where their take or pay goes up in subsequent years. The county didn't want to do that. Uh, Coweta paid down their uh, amount their per gallon amount several years ago, they gave us $9 million to pay down their annual cost. Spalding County didn't want to do that. They didn't want to give us cash up front to pay down their per gallon cost. So there were a lot of things. We don't maintain the Coweta system, obviously. We maintain the Spalding County system. So there were a lot of things that just didn't match up. I, I, I really don't think when they said they wanted a contract like Coweta, I don't really think that they knew what Coweta's contract said. So once we gave it to them, they were like, well, no, this is not really what we want. So it kind of it kind of started back over. Sir? Was that contract available to them before they asked? Uh, yes. And we put it. Yeah, I mean, it's an open record. I provided a copy of that contract along the month. Did you put a $3 million take or pay, or $3 million gallon a day take or pay immediately in that option, which where Coward County currently is? Um, you know, we said pay the $9 million, take over the complete operation. And I think the price we came to them was three twenty-five dollars per 1,000 gallons. Yeah, but it was, so we, it was like three dollars. We gave the contract just like how just we like how said, County asked we did what they asked for. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think to answer your question, Truman, in my discussions with the county attorneys, we never got a formal response back from them on it. Uh, they started trying to pick it apart and find more reasons they didn't like it than they did like it. So that's kind of where things died, I think. That, uh, did, just, have just. They any, okay, you gave them the contract. <clears throat> have they responded any kind of way uh, as to. To the Spalding County contract? Uh, just the responses that Dr. Keller and I have observed in their meetings, because we've attended all of their meetings, and that the Spalding, the Coweta contract's not an option. That that went off the table <laughs> pretty much the first meeting, the first meeting that they had, that, that went off the table. Uh, well, have they told you exactly what kind of contract they want? Ma'am, we've been having they, they, for a long time. They have not. They have not. They don't want what, what, what we've 
telling you what it is. Yeah, and, and I give you this timeline to kind of give you an idea, you know, that we've been we've been available and, mm -hmm. and talking about this and had options since February of 2018. Well, actually, sooner than that. Well, yeah, I mean, we... A 12 MOU of understanding with the airport issue and the fourth item on the MOU that y'all signed was the start engagement of the 2020 contract. So, technically, this has been on the clock since 2012. At the, uh, at the March 19th meeting when Mr. Wilson told the entire authority about the uh, preliminary discussions on the joint authority, uh, just my observations were uh, some of the members were quite reluctant to, to give serious consideration to that. But it, it was the first time that they knew about it. You know, nobody had really thought it through. Uh, they, some of the uh, authority members who were more negative toward it had not been involved in some of the preliminary discussions, so they kind of got hit with it cold. So had I been in their shoes, I would have had a similar reaction. Uh, but th there's no way to vet this out in time uh, for us to make a decision by the time the contract runs out. So the options are we need to earnestly renegotiate the contract or we need to we need to pause just a minute to try to answer some of the preliminary questions or you could just tell me today no nah, we don't want to go that route. You're coming from our smaller meeting that we had an idea that came out was the Coweta goes to take her pay, correct me, Dr. Keller, December 31st, 2022, to, from 3 million to 5 million gallons. On 21st. What's that? Come January 1 on 21, on 2022, 20. is they, when they ramp up. The 5 million is the is to try to at least get the current contract extended for a couple of years to that point where a significant amount more water will be coming in and then that gives us that relief in regards to knowing that we're at least covered with a contract through that five million gallon take or pay contract and then if there is that dialogue about renegotiation of a long-term contract and or authority creation would give us the reassurance that at least we have the revenue stream for a couple more years. Uh, I, I would, I would be careful to comp I, I would be careful to, and that's a good idea, Mr. Holberg, I would be careful to bring other contracts into the mix. I, I think I think the Spal us in Spalding County and Regional are negotiating good faith based on what their needs are, what our needs are, and what the contract says, and I would hate to tie in what's going to happen in Coweta or what's going to happen here and there. I, I think we need to focus on Spalding County. That's that's just my opinion. Is it in our best interest to extend the current contract with the county? Is it the I, I, I don't know whether or not they would want to extend the contract. I, yeah. I, think, I think we need a drop dead date. I think that it would be prudent to to not cut this discussion off, but look maybe for another couple of months, but at some point there's got to be a drop dead date. So I think if we discuss this for a little while longer till we set a drop dead date and then go back to them, uh, but I, I really would hate to cut this discussion off completely and say, no, we're not even going to consider that. Okay. I, I, I think there's got to be some commonality mm -hmm. of interest first in having a, a joint operation. In, in order to answer the question about the extension, if the county or the county water authority is not interested in this concept of going to a joint operation, then extension probably not is, is not something they would favor. And you know, it, it might be in our interest if we could extend it, based on what you know Doug has said. I think he, he makes a valid point there. But I'm not sure it's going to take both sides to agree to an extension in order to get that. Now, if we are to go towards a joint 
authority concept. As Kenny said, and Kenny gave you a very good, concise explanation of where this has been and where it's you know, kind of headed. But the first thing we'd have to do is go to the General Assembly for a local act creating a joint city county no, ordinance I don't think or authority. You do that first, Drew. Well, maybe not first, I mean, but at some point that would have to be done. I think you're going to need probably two to three years of examination and due diligence to really make this thing come about, even if there's a new joint authority. Uh, the big question is the fact the city's got more assets in, in play, certainly, than the county does. Keep in mind that, as Kenny pointed out also, you've got a combined utility system in which our electric revenues, together with our water and sewer revenues, make up our revenue base that's pledged towards repayment of the debt. The county has only their water system revenue. We so really don't have any sewer system there, um, to speak of out here at this time. Okay. Now, a new authority <clears throat> would not have the benefit of the electric revenues. Our coverage, our debt coverage ratio, which makes revenue bonds feasible, Hold increases by about tenfold over the legal requirements because of those electric revenues. They wouldn't have that in a new authority. The other thing they wouldn't have is any history for a bond rate. We've got a good successful bond rating today that we can issue debt revenue bond did that much cheaper. So they, these are just as a these are factors. some of the things that we are in. I think we that come, come back to us when you, when you I think it. right now what we need to do is hear from them yeah. again and see maybe what next steps are. Right. And I, I just wanted to keep you informed on where we were so that nobody was left out. Okay, cool. Thank Is that you. good? Okay. Um, next on the agenda, uh, discuss operating hours of the City of Griffin Transfer Station and the feasibility of reducing same by one hour. Have you been here for hours? Okay, thanks. I appreciate the time. Um, I'll be brief, I promise. In your packet, or the attachment to the agenda item, you'll see these set of documents here. I'm sure you've had time to go over them. This is basically a 12-month study that I've done. Our, our scale software has a uh, has the capability of giving us an hourly intake. It uh, kind of gets down to how much, how many tons we take in by the hour. So briefly, what all of this says is our current operating hours at the transfer station are 7 in the morning to 6 p.m. in the evening. The Pine Ridge landfill stops taking waste at 4.30, last truck in around 4.40 so where they can get their co their daily cover on. Um, what we've had here, to kind of give you a quickie, um, from, from February 1st of 2018 to February 28th of 2019, from the hours of 5 to 6, we took in a total of 433 tons. Wait, wait, repeat it. In a 12-month period. Mm -hmm. From between the hours of 5 and 6 p.m., mm -hmm. our, our intake at the transfer station totally for that year was 433 tons. Okay. That's a, 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 on 187 separate transactions. <laughs> now you divide that by 52 weeks, that's about four transactions per week. That's about less than one a day. <laughs> okay, uh, that 435 tons. You divide it by how many weeks, it's about eight and a half tons a week. Our disposal rate, I mean our, 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 our revenue stream for that is $35.63 a ton. That's what we charge for people for tipping fees. So that averages out to about $82 a day in revenue. The cost of operation for those days was about $122 a day. What is your recommendation? Close from five to six. Close it from five to six. Right. You gotta close it at five o'clock. That sounds good. Can I get an amen? Thank you. <laughs> okay. We appreciate you having well, the facts you, to support that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, anybody that'd like to discuss it further, please no, do sir. so. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> 
Okay, next, discuss downtown boxes and potential ordinance Donation boxes. The order, oh, discuss donation boxes. What did I say downtown? <laughs> donation boxes <laughs> and potential ordinance proposal options. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so I'll make this quick. <laughs> All right, so um, basically what we're doing here is uh, we got a couple ordinances, um, amendments we're proposing to do, but before we do anything, we want to make sure you guys are on board, and if there's any suggestions, we can deal with that up front. Um, so I'm going to talk about donation boxes. Is this thing on? All right, here we go. All right, so we know we have donation boxes throughout the city. They're starting to pop up. You got one across at Jerry's. You got some at Walmart, um, all the in different places. And actually, they added a couple more of this, I think, last week. But um, as you look at the donation boxes, a couple things to keep in mind. Um, those are the ones in town. That's Jerry's right there. Um, that's all these over the bottom right corner. I forget what these other two are. Franks. Okay, Franks. What the concern is, a couple of things. One, during research, I found that uh, um, people can, this is, just a, I guess, a fact, um, a gentleman died trying to get inside of a box to, to I guess, to sleep in for the night. Uh, also, um, you've got some people that don't, that have, where they regulate the donation boxes, but they don't pay the fines. So in one city, there's like 85 of the same boxes, and they haven't paid any, any of the regulations or the fines for having those boxes, so or getting, getting them permitted. So um, we want to baby basically be able to have the ability to do to regulate those boxes, the donation boxes, versus having them to sprout out anywhere in town. Um, this is your illustrious um, outdoor theater in front of Walmart here. Um, this is what they can potentially look like if they're not monitored or have some type of, um, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, regulation on how to handle um, okay. the boxes. Do they have to come in and apply to put these boxes up? As of right now, they don't. There's no regulation. They, I mean, they've just been popping up. So uh, they're not I mean, we can go try to call people on the box and get them to come clean it up, but we want to have something on the books to, that we can point at and say, hey, here's what I need you to do. You propose to them to put something on the books that they come in? Yeah. They'll, yeah, okay. they'll have to get a permit, pay, uh -huh. they'll, they'll pay uh, a fee, and we'll know where they're located, and basically you can kind of tell them what to put on the box and make them look uniform and, and whatnot. So we're trying to prevent what you see up here on the, on the screen right now at the end of the day. So they're going to be expected to pay a fee, which they get no revenue from. Say again? Do you expect them to pay a fee? Yeah, so a permit fee. So like a hundred, two hundred bucks, whatever it may be. But they get no revenue from that. Um, they get revenue. They, they get revenue. Yeah, they get revenue. That's, that's, like, that's like having a Goodwill box out front. You put the clothes in and they can take it to Goodwill and they go sell the clothes. Yeah, but a person who applies for the permit, how are they going to get their fee money back? Where they sell their stuff or or bundle it up and ship it as used clothing. Right, and ship it overseas right. or something like that. Yeah. Is there okay. a provision for like distance? Oh. Uh, no. So like a, I guess I'm asking, so a parking lot to have 25 of these boxes? So um, that's part of what you have to kind of put in the regulation, depending on how you how you word it. Um, and I haven't quite gotten that far yet. Okay. Because I wanted to make sure we were all on board before I moved forward. Um, at the end of the day, these are the three options. Uh, craft an ordinance, leave it as is, or then just prohibit them all together. So. Okay. What type of fee is other communities charging? Um, I think around Gwinnett, they're charging a couple hundred dollars. Are you? Um, mm -hmm. And they'd be like a permit sticker at the end. They have a... You know that... There's one that, I mean, it literally tells you you got to have two-inch letters, and, I mean, it specifically tells you what the box needs to look like. And the difference, too, in the, in the Walmart box, the Walmart box, that's some um, pressed plywood or pressed uh, particle board or something like that. It's not even a metal container. So... All right, moving along. Like, like three like options. 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 I, think, I don't think number three is an option. What was that? Prohibited well, you know, hey, you had to put it up there, trying there's to make it balanced. There's a case law in their favor on that. Right. I, I, I think option. But we'll look at that because it may be an option. Yeah. Uh, option two. Like option one. Yes. Option one. Okay. We'll work on that. 
this is um, I've had a lot of experience with these, and one of the things you need to think about, and and is the one of the reasons that those get so messed mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. with stuff is there's not a specific collection schedule for right. those boxes. Right. They put them out, and then they just get full, and then when they come through again, <laughs> so they get over. So one of the ordinance things you might want to take into consideration uh -huh. is to have a published schedule for collection for that stuff doesn't overflow. Got like it. That. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Let me ask this one question. Yep. So if this is in the parking lot of Walmart, Aldi, whatever, why are they not responsible for the appearance of it? Because like at this point, it this is... That's the Walmart right there. Right. So then why is... Why is is it owner of the population? Yeah, that should be Halpern or Walmart or whoever. Yeah, so that'll be part of the. the that'll be part of it. Right now, under your zoning, that's not an allowable use within that parking lot. So it's true. So technically, it's prohibited. Technically, yeah. yeah. So I to from Walmart to put the thing out there, put the box out there. I would think. I would hope they would, but we will require them to do that. They'll get permission from the property owner to do that. So, right, Drew is actually correct. So, if it's not in the ordinance, technically, we could go out there and start citing them, but there's so many. I want to come to you guys first before we open up a can of worms uh, to make sure everything was, everybody was on the same page. No, I agree. I, I think far too often it turns into a depository of things yeah. outside of the box. Right. And people sleep in them too, most time. Okay. In the wintertime. All right, so. We will work on something and bring it back to you. Perfect. All right. So food trucks. This is really short and sweet. So um, we know food trucks are becoming more popular. Um, even um, Southern Park has a location for food trucks. Um, we just want to be able to create a ordinance where they can be regulated, where they pay a fee to come into town and <coughs> make sure all the health department stuff is up to date and so on and so forth. So same, same kind of three options. Um, create an ordinance, leave as is, or do we prohibit them? We'd like you to create an ordinance. Let me I'll kind of weigh in on that a yep. little bit, too, because I'm having about a question. Five years ago, I did create an ordinance for the city of Sonoy. I think Jessica worked on at the time when she was still with me. And what they basically were going to do, there's kind of been three approaches that communities have taken. One is to authorize food trucks to come in and park on the right of way of the street, side of the street to operate. <clears throat> Two has been to have a designated park, generally a either public or private property where food trucks gather that you can go. If you have been out to uh, Austin, Texas, for example, they've yeah. got three or four places around downtown Austin that are full of food trucks. And that's the only place you're going to find them. And then the third is to only allow them in the community under special events. Right. Well, we started off in Sonoy wanting to bring them downtown or to allow them to come downtown and park on the side of the street. The local restaurant Owners Correct. raised all sort of cane. Correct. And I don't blame them because they do pay taxes, they have upkeep, they have you know certain standards that have to be met for the brick and mortar type business operation. And this is competition to them. Correct. They wound up, they only allow them over there in the park for special events. We're looking at it again because the downtown development authority uh, still to do, they do a lot of things downtown itself within the uh, area where they still want to bring them in for special events there. Right. And that it, enough time may have healed some of the resentment if it only happens three or four times a year. Yeah, and so we were. Some real issues you need to decide here. Right, we're, we're allowing for special events now. Um, I wasn't necessarily looking for them to be here five days a week, seven days a week, that kind of thing. Um, but we do have. Uh, placeholder for silent park for food trucks, so you kind of need to have something uh, in the ordinance to kind of dictate what they can do, what they can't do. You've got another gentleman down the street here wanted to do, I think he did food trucks this past weekend or weekend for last or something like that, um, having an artsy craft kind of fair thing. So we just basically, if the food truck is going to come, we want to be able to have, hey, you can come here at this time and operate under these circumstances and XYZ. Not necessarily a you know, every day of 12 to 1 kind of thing. So we wouldn't have that kind of issue with the, with the restaurant, so. I'm in favor of one. Just, just have something. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, we got to regulate. Okay, cool. I, I got one question. Yes, sir. Um, since you brought that up, I, I've been approached um, in, I think, in Gwinnett County. Mm -hmm. Some of the salons are offering wine 
when people go to get their nails done. Um, I like wine. <laughs> I mean, they, 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 yeah, right, they, right, they, right. They're, they're doing wine, and, they, and they, someone asked me about it, and I talked to Janet about it. Mm. We don't have anything on our books right. about that, if you could. Well, we do have something on our books. They have to come buy a license, just like anybody else who sells alcohol. And it's not really legal in Georgia right now to just give it away as some of these places have done. We know this is happening in other communities. Mm -hmm. We've had people here. Uh, this, uh, what's it called, Stash Studio mm -hmm. on, on 6th Street, okay. I think was doing that for a while and I think after Karen had a talk about I'm glad to see Karen's back here. Uh, I think she had a talk with them and they kind of so, uh, quit doing what is it now. called? Uh, Sipping uh, sip and stroke. Sip and shop. Yeah. Sip and shop or whatever it is. Oh, they've got a license. Yeah. They're licensed. So you, can, yeah. you, you just yeah. have to go. If you want to get a license, and the big thing with these small users or small vendors is state law requires a licensee to buy from a wholesaler. Mm -hmm. You can't go down to Kipps or to the grocery store and buy. You know, so a, few a barber shop what? could do that if they wanted to a hair salon and. If a hair salon could get a license to dispense wine, but then they have to go back to a wholesaler, and the wholesaler's going to probably tell them, you've got to buy you know, a full case of this wine, which is what, 12 bottles, I guess. And if you want three or four different types, you're going to buy three or four They're different They're serving cases. it, not selling it, right? They're just giving it away, I think. But you know they're probably building it into the price base. The price, I'm pretty sure. Right. They, they're not losing money off of it. It's been around since the 90s. Really? Yeah. It's what? Which is not, maybe not here, but in Texas it is. I don't go get it. I don't go get it. All right. <laughs> Good? All right. Thank you. All right. Okay. <coughs> okay, now um, we need sewer. to trucks. Sewer. Discuss possible changes to the sewer use ordinance. Okay, same kind of thing. Tucson and I have decided, we've learned from our mistakes, we're going to bring you our options first and then we'll draft things so we can hopefully prohibit having to do a lot more work. So this is our grease bin ordinance. We, um, Officer White came to me and said that we've had some issues with grease bins around town and I learned a lot about grease and the different kinds of things that um, we actually have for grease. We have grease traps and we have recycled grease bins. They are a, there are differences. A grease trap is what you see inside of a restaurant. That's what's in the kitchen. That's what grease actually is contained in inside. A recycled grease bin is something that a lot of times is out it can be inside, um, but a lot of times they are outside. A recycled grease bin is not required. You do not have to have one as a restaurant, but they want them because they make money off of them. They sell this grease back to companies, and so they get um, money for recycling that grease, and only certain kinds of grease can be recycled. So we found in looking at this that we have a couple different um, places in our ordinance that deal with installation. Um, we have adopted our grease management program back in January of 2016. We require new food service facilities to install these kind of uh, grease traps here and then we, we require them to capture that grease on premises. But there are no requirements currently in our ordinance for recycled grease bins. So everything that we have deals with a grease trap or an interceptor for installation. For maintenance, we do require that they meet certain maintenance requirements in our grease management program. We do say that they have to be pumped a minimum amount of times and Officer White can go out and say that needs to be pumped as well. So we do have some requirements again for grease traps when it comes to installation and maintenance, but not for recycled grease bins. This is a recycled grease bin. All of these pictures are within the city of Griffin, so it's almost similar to a donation box. For some reason, they seem to just accumulate other trash. This is another picture of one where you can see the grease has spilled on the right side, where you can see the um, cardboard trying to soak it up. And this one's just nasty. I don't even know where that is. But what people do is they just start accumulating trash beside it because it does look like a trash um, container. Where is that one, Doug? Applebee's. Applebee's. Okay. Um, we have currently in our ordinance in um, the sanitation UDC code that a recycled grease bin cannot be contained in a container pad with the dumpster. But 
almost every single person puts their recycle grease bin in the container pad. So we need to remove that. I don't think there's any reason in talking with Phil or with Doug that we don't want them there. Um, in my opinion, I'd much rather have them there if we're going to continue to allow them to be outside because then they're contained and we don't have to see them. As most of you know, we've had a problem with the one in the DDA parking lot. Um, there is one still within that dumpster pad. We didn't put it there. We don't know exactly when it got there or who allowed them to put it there because it's not on their property. Um, it gets dumped occasionally by employees and then they leave the lid open. Well, when it rains, guess what comes to the top? The grease and then everything goes out that way. Um, we've had a lot of spills back there and a lot of problems in which the owner of that company has been cited. But one of my concerns to prosecute a case like that, we don't require it to be one owner. So he could come in and say, well, I didn't do that somebody else downtown did and there, it would be hard for us to prove because it's not locked it's not registered we don't necessarily know who owns it we know who dumps in it the majority of the time um, we've been watching as well so we're trying to learn more about it but right now we really don't have a way to make sure we know who owns that grease bin so our possibilities here <laughs> We would like, as a new restaurant comes in, to require that they put them inside. This is a new restaurant, so not somebody that's currently operating, but a new restaurant that would come in and either change an existing structure to a restaurant or build a whole new structure that they have. Any of their recycled grease bins that they want be interior grease bins, not outside. That would eliminate any kind of dumping. You know, I mean, literally people walk down the street holding buckets, and so it sloshes everywhere, gets in our storm drains, and we have a problem there. So we would ask that a new restaurant be required, if they're going to have one, to put it inside. We wouldn't regulate the size, the type, or the location within the structure, but just that it would have to be inside. And then for existing restaurants, we have a couple different options. We can require them to put them inside as well. What that's going to take is them having to buy a new recycled grease bin. Um, we would give them six months to comply. We can give them a year, whatever it is y'all think um, is reasonable. We would not, again, regulate the type, location, or size of the grease bin, just that they have to have one inside if they want one. This would also require them to pick up or have the company that owns the recycled grease bin pick up the one that's outside. The second, uh, there's a current interior recycle grease bin that's here at Arby's. Arby's, thank you. And then this one's at Hardy's. So a lot of our restaurants do actually put them inside, especially when they are um, renovating. They'll go ahead and just add them into the kitchen. It's easier for them as well. The second option would be to say that you can keep it outside, you can keep your current container, but it must be sealed and piped so that only the company getting in it can get into it and the person pumping it out can get it out. Um, they would have to have their location approved by the city, so they would have to come in and let us know where it's going to go. We would charge them a permit fee um, and then also have them give them six months to comply with getting that taken care of or whatever time you deem to be reasonable. The third option um, is that it must be locked. So an actual lock placed on the grease bin that says only my employee has a key, we know whose it is, it can't be used by multiple restaurants, so again if we have an issue, we know who to cite or who to deal with before we have to cite. And then the fourth option is to do nothing and leave it as it is. <laughs> I don't have a uh, grease bin now, where does it go? You do not have to recycle grease. You have to have a grease trap, though. So if you have a certain, and Doug, I asked Officer White to be here, you may want to come up here and answer some of these questions because I knew it would be a little more technical than what I know. Why are we going to charge my permit fee for helping us? Well, they're getting money for that recycled grease. They're getting paid for that. So it's a benefit for them to have one. They don't have to have one. They have to have a grease trap to keep their fats, oils, and grease out of our sewer system. But they do not have to have a recycled grease bin. That's Which a plus really for them. Treatment condition of discharging to our sewer. Right. Now, Brant talked to me, and Doug, you're probably familiar with this, about three or four months ago about expanding the requirement to multifamily structures, I think, of greater than four units. Correct. Um, DeKalb County will be the first one that has done this and passed it to regulate uh, grease bins or grease recycling at apartment complexes, and it's been very helpful for them since they passed this ordinance. That's new construction or existing? It's new construction at the moment. Okay. You, it would be impossible to retrofit yeah. a current apartment complex to put in a grease trap because then it would just actually become a large septic tank. 
Yes, when you said uh, um, existing restaurants, they have to have a grease trap, but they don't have to have a. Uh, how do they? How are they supposed to dispose of the grease? I'll let you sort of explain that. If they, don't, if they don't recycle their grease, they usually just put it in a dumpster, and then Phil's crew comes around and then squishes it, and it gets all over his trucks and all over the ground as they drive around. Um, recycled grease is something that <clears throat> anybody that has a deep fryer uh, does any type of deep fry. That's what they do with that. They store it there. They, there's usually companies that come around restaurants uh, that are chains and and give them the bins to put that in there. Then they come by. I think they pay anywhere between uh, ten to fifty cents a gallon for it. Um, <clears throat> recycled grease is a good thing because it it is used for many things from feeding uh, feed and seed for your animals to makeup for ladies they use that for lipstick it's uh, put in here but if you, we have restaurants we don't require that they uh, dispose of the grease no the health, that's regulated through the health department. All we require is that it does not get in our sewer, sewer system. So we, you have to have a grease trap depending on what kind of food you're making. Like Starbucks does not right. because they don't have a lot of grease for what they're doing. But, for example, Angelo's does. And so they have a grease trap within their, normally in the sink, um, but they also have a recycled grease bin because like they want to make if, money. If, if a restaurant has a grease trap, they should be required to <coughs> store the grease. Have but only if they're deep fried. Grease. Yeah, you can't you can't recycle all grease. Some grease cannot be recycled because of it's what's brown, brown grease. grease. Yeah. <laughs> only <laughs> yellow grease. Recycled, but they should be. We don't want it in our sewer system. No. So we don't have any rules saying that. Or even when Phil pick it up, if they got a grease trap, they should be required to contain the grease somewhere. Well, say so you would have like a uh, like Subway. They have grease traps, but they don't. <clears throat> have grease bins because they don't do any deep frying. Their sole grease trap is to catch the fats that come off their food when they're rinsing so that they don't get in the sewer system. Mm. <clears throat> it's gross. Do they have a, uh, do they have a uh, container? Not a, not a subway, no ma'am. Because they don't have the type of grease that they can recycle. Right. So it would be useless for them. To understand the function of the grease trap, the grease collects into a separate Container that then they that hardens or they dump into a trash bin. Mm -hmm. Is that how it works? A, a grease trap would be what they would. It would it would be effectively as to say that I rinse my food or rinse fatty food. Uh, it goes into this interceptor. It collects there, uh, and after a period of time, we put them on a schedule. They come out and have somebody pump that out. That's taken away and pre-treated. And how many? Um, so those are normally two two to five gallons or more. Um, a recycle um, like an intercept, interceptor. An interceptor is going to be anywhere at 1,500 gallons now. We don't allow any grease trap in the city without being 1,500 gallons unless they are approved by the um, the. We have a body of panel. If somebody can test that they don't want to put in a 1,500 gallon, they get to come before a panel of four independent people that make that decision against what I say. <coughs> So I guess the question is, well, I think I didn't know that we didn't even regulate recycled grease or that there was a difference. So now that I do know and we've had some issues with recycled grease bins, how do we want to handle it? Do we want to say any new restaurant needs to have it inside? Are we okay with that if they're new and cut not yet here that the in recycled grease bin has to be in the interior? Okay, so if everybody's okay with that, then the question really becomes what about an existing restaurant? Are we going to say if as of this date, if you're here, you got to move it in or we're okay with it being out but it's got to be locked or if you're here, you're here and it is what it is? What are the costs associated with the different options? Um, some of these companies actually give them the equipment. Okay. Uh, it's just going to take up space within their facility. As you've seen, like the Hardy's pitcher, Hardy's has a fairly large one because they go through a lot of grease. Um, your Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A had two in their facility, two big, huge ones, because um, they go through a lot of that. But <coughs> some of these containers are smaller. They're fairly small, uh, so they wouldn't, you know, they could be 200 gallons um, uh, circular. Uh, they have some that actually fit up under their shelving that's already in the store, so it wouldn't take up too much of their space in their store. Mm -hmm. um, and it, if they get with the right company, and that's the choice there they have to make, they can probably get the bin free because they want them to recycle. Let me ask you a question. The, the intent of this is to clean it up <coughs> on the, the 
outside appearance? Or that, the intent of it is, yes, because you, you, the grease that's out there draws rats, bugs, um, other ro other items that are just gross. You get people that track through it or walk through it, and now they're tracking it all over their sidewalks, all out in your streets. Uh, example, the one that we were having an issue with over here at the DDA parking lot, they would spill it, the trucks would drive in it, they'd track it all up the road, it looks really bad. Um, I've had several instances where he's trying to haul it from the restaurant all the way to that bend, end up hitting a stump or, or sidewalk that's not exactly level, then he dumps it all over the ground and now we got a big mess there. The, the intent of this is basically to keep it in their store so it's not nasty everywhere else and making the city look good, bad. I think the, the easiest thing for current restaurants, I think, is to register them to a particular bin mm -hmm. and require that bin Lock to be locked and mm -hmm. only used by those one or two restaurants and then we hold them accountable for Still the mess. Right, <laughs> and all that new ones maybe have some different requirements if you're building a new restaurant then yeah, have some different requirements. And all that's going to take, I think the majority of the ones that we have looked at, and Doug would know this more than I would, but they have a place where you can put a lock, so you're just going to have to go buy a lock right. um, and give keys to employees, so it's a very cost-effective way to regulate it. We would give them, you know, send out a letter to every restaurant and say you have 30 days to register your location with us. You have to have permission from that property owner, I think, as well. I'm not sure how the DDA needs to be responsible for having grease bins on their lot. And again, though, that's something that, you know, we would need to decide how we want to do that because there are certain places where downtown in particular, I don't know where else you're going to put them except for in right-of-ways and in public places. So that's what we wanted to hear from y'all so we knew what to draft. Okay. So, let me make new restaurants we're okay with requiring it to be inside. Existing restaurants, just lock it and register with us so we know whose it is. And then what, what do we say about the location of it? Good question. <laughs> if it's on their property, I think it's fine. If it's on public right-of-way, are we okay with that? It's all, if it's on public right-of-way or on somebody else's property. I mean, there, the issue of the one that was the DDA lot, it was sitting on the sidewalk on Slayton Alley, and all the grease was getting on the sidewalk and blocking the sidewalk, so then it got moved to the DDA lot. And then it got moved inside the, the cage of the DDA lot. So not on the right-of-way. Now it's behind the fence of the DDA. Now it's behind mm -hmm. the fence of the DDA. Because we don't give anybody else permission to Which put anything on the right-of-way. Uh, got to get off the right-of-way. <laughs> okay. Thanks. For All that. right. Keep in mind that alleys are right away. Yes. Right. So downtown restaurants like Angelo's and Milltown and Corner Cafe and this one to be inside. They're gonna have, we're pretty much telling them they're gonna have to move it inside. Is there is there a way for us to make a? I guess my thing is like Doug was saying the sidewalks. They don't need to be on the sidewalk. <laughs> Is there, is there a way for us to limit or put some geographical boundary that like if it's within this area, it can be placed in the alley or whatever, but like to eliminate just being cast on the sidewalk anywhere or just randomly? Let's, let's, let me see if I can get with Drew and work on some language for that. I think we can figure out a way to maybe make that for downtown just out of necessity. Um, and and maybe survey each of the restaurants that. where they're currently at just to try to figure out if, to what's me, working it, or not working. If it's not a thoroughfare where where there's any real traffic or anything, that's one thing. But if you're putting it somewhere where it's very evident and obvious and people have easy access to it, I think we need to be mindful about Excuse me, ma'am, I'm no, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, the one thing I might also want to interject is the fact that when they do have the outside containers and they do spill it, um, I mean, you're having to pick up uh, five to t 10 gallons worth of hot grease and pour it in this bin. Mm -hmm. Then they do spill it. Then they come out there with a water hose and try to hose it down, and then that solidifies it, makes a nasty mess. And then, or they try to just hose it down with chemicals, and then it ends up in his storm drain. Um, so now we're back into the restaurants now committed and illicit discharge to the storm system, something other than just rainwater. So I get one of our major points in trying to put the, make them put this inside the building is to help control the environmental issues that they are actually causing. That makes sense. Can we tell them that they have to use like kitty litter or something? To it does help a little bit, but. 
I guess that, that falls in the, to the responsibility of the owner of the restaurant and the responsibility of the person that's doing it because they're going out there at night, they're dumping it at nighttime. If they spill it, they don't care. They're most likely in the teenagers. It's not their problem. It becomes a restaurant's problem. Do we have any liability issues? Should they spill the grease on a public right away? A restaurant employee spill the grease? I'm thinking it's like any other kind of, you know, hazard. If it's a spill, I think there's a special foam they could use to spray on it. You know, to they can, but the problem is they don't do it. And so when we find it the next morning, we don't know who did it. We can make a pretty good guess based on the location of the spill. But if you're downtown and it's spilled on Hill Street, you can pick a number of restaurants that could have done that. So we don't know. Um, so it is hard to regulate. There are times that Doug has had to issue citations for illicit discharge. When we do that, we also, um, if we know about it, Doug has had to go out there and clean it up or have somebody um, in our in, within the city clean it up, and then we ask for restitution institution in court. Um, so we have collected some of our fees that way associated with it. But I think the concern has always been when we're not around and we don't know and they haven't called and said we're the ones that did it, unless it's right, and even right now, if it's right at that you, grease bin, we register don't know. it and you know where it is and they should have a, a lock and key and it's spilled all around it, then you know who's Correct. responsible for mm -hmm. it. That'll make it much easier. Okay. All right. Thank all right. you. Thank you. Okay, can I get a, uh, a motion to go into uh, is it, is it, is it going to closed session? Yes. Make a motion to go into closed mm -hmm. session. Second. Second. Motion by Commissioner Hubbard, second by <laughs> Commissioner Brock. All in favor? Let's go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to stay up there. Oh, dang. Yeah. Wait a minute. That's what y'all said about it.